So today I have Greg Alexander as our guest on our show. He's Chief Investment Officer at Capital 54. Um, Greg, welcome to the show. Sammy, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So short story why I invited Greg. So last Sunday I was um, jogging at 9 p.m. in the evening and listened to the <laughs> Build to Sell radio and um, you were a guest there. And the, the catchy title was how to sell a 30% 30 30 business, uh, again, how to sell a 30% consultancy for 160 million. Um, and I mean, that was, uh, uh, you lived up to the expectation um, in this podcast. And I thought um, we have many of our listeners with professional services and consultancies, and you would be super interesting to have as a guest. And it worked out super fast. So thank you so much that you're here now. Yeah, that podcast was a lot of fun. That's with John Lorelo. Um, and uh, he has a company called Built to Sell. And uh, I've been a listener of his for a long time. And then through a friend of a friend, it was suggested that I'd be on that show. And I'm glad that I did it. And I'm glad you liked it. And this is the power of the world we live in. I, you're in Germany, correct? Yes, I'm in Germany, Munich. And I'm in Texas, and as a result of podcasting, you and I now know each other. Isn't that an amazing thing? Yeah, the world becomes so small now, so it's really yeah. amazing. People should tap into this. Um, it's powerful. Yeah, I agree. It's powerful. Yeah. Um, before we deep dive into, into um, the topic that you're an expert in, I would like to ask one, two first personal questions. So you already said where you're living. Um, what do you love to do outside of work? Um, in the wintertime, I love to ski. Although this year, given the situation we're dealing with, that hasn't been easy to do. Um, and I do live in the United States. I like to go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. That's my favorite place. Uh, and in the summertime, I am a, uh, a struggling golfer, although I love being in nature with my friends and uh, enjoying myself. And I keep trying to get better. But those are the two things that I do for enjoyment. Okay, cool. Yeah, I tried myself at golfing as well, but I struggled so much that I stopped it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so tell me about your company, Capital 54, and your initiative, Collective 54. What are you doing there? Yeah, so Capital 54 is my family office. And for those that might not be familiar with the term family office, think of a family office as a private equity firm, but instead of investing other people's money, I'm investing my own money. And um, Capital 54 invests in a very specific thing extremely tightly focused. We invest in what we call a boutique professional services firm. So what does that mean? That means anybody in industry code 54, that's the reason for the 54 in the name. That's the North American industry classification system. Um, and within that industry category, you might find uh, attorneys, accountants, consultants, designers, uh, IT service providers, pretty much who, anybody that sells and delivers their expertise. And as it relates to the definition of the word boutique, um, we invest in companies that are post startup, but pre scale. And the easiest way to think about that is more than five employees, but fewer than 250. So they're past the stage of, of, of wondering if they're going to make it. And they're, they're now, you know, they have a successful firm, happy clients, happy employees, but you know, they want to reach their full potential, which means scaling the firm and then eventually exiting the firm. So we provide two things to entrepreneurs in that category. We provide growth capital because it, it does take money to make money. And we also provide management know-how. We have a codified playbook that uh, has recently been uh, documented and made available in my book, which is called The Boutique, How to Start, Scale and Sell a Professional Services Firm. Uh, so that's what we invest in. That's what Capital 54 does. Now, one of the investments that we made to answer the second part of your question uh, was in Collective 54. And that can be confusing because they, they have a similar um, nomenclature. But, yes. but Collective 54 is a membership organization. So the category that it's in, you might be familiar with like YPO or EO or Vistage or things of that nature. We're a similar business, but we're different in three ways. We're narrow in that we only focus on a single industry, which is professional services. We're deep in that we serve the owner. Um, we're completely focused on helping the owner create wealth. And we're tight in that we're, we're built in the cloud on demand anywhere. So we have members all over the world and uh, we're able to, you know, through the power of technology, things like we're doing today, be super time efficient in the way that we engage with members. 
Mm-hmm. That's what Collective 54 is. They meet once a month virtually. Uh, we drop them into peer groups of 10. And, uh, you know, they, they work together to try to overcome the obstacles that are standing in the way of growing, scaling, and selling their firms. Yeah, I love what you're saying here because, I mean, I saw it as a management consultant. Uh, it was my first career, and I saw that these owners, usually they stick to themselves. Uh, they think they have a magic uh, wand, and they don't want to share anything with anyone. And so they don't speak to anyone, and they don't learn anything. And uh, that's why they usually they go until a certain um, size and then they stop growing and that's it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we'll give you some data to support that. So as of the end of 2020, uh, now this is United States data, forgive me, um, but there were 1.47 million professional services firms in the United States. And only 4,116 of them have reached scale, scale defined as those with more than 250 billable employees. That's one quarter of 1%. So the other 99 plus percent of the people, they want to scale and someday they want to sell their firms, but they're not doing it. And when you ask them why, they'll say two things. I don't have the growth capital to do it, which is a little bit of an excuse in my opinion, because the world is flushing capital right now. The real issue is the management know-how. And what I find is, is that most of these people are brilliant. I mean, they truly are. They're domain experts. They know their space just incredibly well. But they might be lacking general business skills, meaning the items of working on the business, you know, how to scale a firm, um, you know, how to, how to run it at scale as opposed to kind of a small lifestyle business. This is the area that they struggle with, and that's the area that we help them with. Mm-hmm. I have um, two case studies that uh, like um, people I know and real cases that happen. And I think it would be super interesting to go through them and you give, give your expert input on what they could have done differently or could do differently. I um, love the case study. Let's get out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one company, they basically started out with uh, 30 consultants, a management consulting company. Um, they, they scaled up to 300 people um, and then they fell back to 200 because they had a cluster problem of having just one, two clients. Uh, what's important to know, they scaled because uh, the two owners are experts in, in networking. They are amazing. And I would have thought that they're never going to reach uh, like 300 employees and a lot of revenue. So they did a great job. Um, but they, they never let go of the network. So they said, I don't want anyone to get in touch with these high profile people. I'm the owner. And if I like, if I share it, I'm, I'm afraid that they're going to take that, uh, that relationship and I'm going to lose it. And they never taught, so to say, a second layer of, of partners to, on how to, how to sell. So I thought they were really bad at selling, to be honest, um, because I had to do some pitch decks. And, and, and saw what, what they did, like the classic was uh, white, like putting a lot of effort into a white paper and then trying to send it to, to some of the, the folks that should be interested, trying to get a meeting and usually never really worked out. Um, so this was one typical case that I see pretty often, to be honest. Um, yeah, that, that is very, very typical. And, you know, there's some thoughts that are flooding into my head right now that I'll, I'll share with you. So. Mm-hmm. If you think about a professional services firm's life cycle, um, I like to think it falls into three categories. Now, sometimes it's not always as neat as this, but generally speaking, this is correct. So you get a couple of bright guys, like in this case study, and they start their firm, and because they truly are experts at whatever it is they do, and they have great, really good personal networks, they get off to a really good start, and they grow their firms, and they have a heck of a lifestyle business. Also, what happens in that moment of time is human nature kicks in. What I mean by that is humans need to be needed. They love to feel important and they use their job as a way to get validation, particularly self-validation. So they eventually grow and they become kings or heroes. And they really like being heroes. But at some point, they become the bottleneck. And they need to stop being the hero and they need to make other heroes in their firm. And it's till they're able to do that, defeat the hero syndrome, uh, that they're uh, able to scale. I mean, does anybody remember who started Accenture? No, they have 505,000 employees right now. 
Now, whatever your opinion is of Accenture, and mine's not particularly good, you, you can't argue with the fact. <laughs> <laughs> you can't argue with the fact that they scaled to 505,000 employees, right? Because they made other heroes and so on and so on, right? So that's the first thing is defeating the hero syndrome and recognizing that professional services firms are collections of people and human nature and how you manage human nature is a really important thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing that happens as you go through your evolutionary curve, which it sounds like it happened there, is that at some point in time, the partners need to transition from a partner-led sales model to a professional commercial sales engine. So if, if all roads lead through the partners and, all, and the partners have to be in every sales call or the partners have to generate every lead, then by definition, you're limited in terms of how big you can become and how successful you can become based on the effectiveness of that small group of partners. Those that crack the code here and make it out of the growth phase into the scales phase and eventually a very successful exit is they invest non-billable time and discretionary budget into building out a commercial sales organization. This means a proper marketing team that can generate leads and sufficient supply and quality and business development professionals that can go on sales calls and represent the firm as good, if not better than the partners and close at a high rate. And that, that transitionary point, which is not easy in professional services for a variety of reasons that I'm sure we'll get into, but that's a very, very important moment in order to make that happen. And then the third thing that I would suggest to you regarding that case study of swelling up to 300 and coming back to 200, it's a mistake to equate success with number of employees. That used to be the ultimate measure in consulting in particular because everything was driven off of the revenue per head model. However, we're living in a new world now. Um, it's a global world. I mean, you and I are, are role modeling that today and technology is changing everything. So I don't think number of employees is the ultimate measure. In fact, the greatest business in the world would have no employees because in the professional services world, your biggest expense item on your income statement is headcount. So if, you, if you're focused on profits, which is these are for-profit businesses, so they are, the fewer the people, the better. And there's really kind of three things that are, allow owners of professional services firms to engage in that might have helped that case study. So first, what can you automate? digital tools can you license or build on your own that can do things that previously required human involvement. And if you can do that, you can scale exponentially because you're decoupling the revenue growth with the headcount growth. That's a key item. Second is where can you offshore? So work that you're doing today, you know, is there a way to tap into a global workforce of people that can do it as well as you can do it, but for much less? Um, which increases profits. And then third, which is fairly new, but coming on like gangbusters, I think driven partly because of the COVID-19 pandemic is the gig economy. So it used to be um, difficult to find and leverage freelancers successfully. But these days with these marketplaces like Catalent, as an example, you, know, you can post a job and hire on a temporary basis, you know, former McKinsey and Bain people that are incredibly talented or former, you know, world-class software engineers, you pick your function and you now can tap into this global workforce, which brings incredible capability to your firm, but also does so in a way that allows you to flex up and flex down based on demand. Um, so those three things, uh, digital transformation and technology adoption, um, the uh, building of a commercial sales organization um, and the leveraging of the gig economy. Um, and also I should say um, the global workforce is a way to really scale organizations. And many of those things didn't exist, you know, back in the day, you know, if you read case studies of the great Marvin Bauer, you know, who created McKinsey as an example, the world was very different after World War II, you know, than it is in 2021, right? So the tools that we have available to us are so different. So therefore, some of the ways that we look at firms, you know, number of employees, as an example, just, just no longer apply. It used to be a belief that if you had greater than 20% margins in, in the world of professional services, you were doing really good. I mean, as you heard in my Built to Sell um, podcast, we ran at 52% margins, right? I mean, that's a 250%. And it was just because we leveraged those things. You know, there, there really wasn't any 
anything special about it. It's just we took advantage of the new resources. Well, it's special that you implemented it. You did it, you know, and um, and I think I don't know any company that that looked at the things that how, that you described right now. So they they're still caught in their old belief systems. They uh, they look for prestige a lot of the times. It's really it's really the hero syndrome, you know. I have a bigger company than you, so I'm more important. Sometimes it's not maybe not conscious, but subconscious. Uh, because they are smart people, so I, I would say they don't do it on purpose. But um, I mean, that's the human nature element of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a tough one. So uh, maybe a first step is to get outside help and have an advisor who can look at your company from the outside because you don't see it by yourself most of the times. I would say. Um, so that's maybe a first one. Um, so I have some follow-up questions. Let's do them step by step. Um, about the professional sales team. Um, I would say that the first um, like fighting back would come um, or the first yeah, feedback would be, I can't do that because our partners have to have the relationship uh, with our clients and they are the only ones who can talk to the same C level that we sell into, for example. So I cannot buy like or build a sales team um, that, that builds that relationship and that doesn't even have the know-how to talk to those people. Yeah. So my response back to that would be, is you're living in another era. That's just not true. I mean, to, to make the claim that only partners in professional services organizations can speak intelligently to C-level executives and large corporations is just false. I mean, it's been proven otherwise. I mean, look, look to other industries for proof points. For example, look at the software industry. I mean, there's world-class software companies like salesforce.com that have 28-year-old kids doing $10 million deals with CFOs of Fortune 50, 50 companies, right? It's just not true. So what I would tell a partner who thinks like that, they should look in the mirror. The reason why that problem exists is because of them. You know, they have been unable to teach others what they can do. And if you give me somebody with a reasonable level of intelligence and a fantastic work ethic, and you can teach them, you know, what it is that you do. And if you have patience with them and you're willing to develop them and hold their hand for a period of time, they can get there for sure. I will tell you in my own personal experience for what it's worth, um, I, at one point I was them, I was the rainmaker, and then I wasn't. And the people that eventually became the rainmakers, you know, the, the great world-class business development people, they were better at it than I ever was. And the reason for that was, is that was their sole job. You know, as the owner of the firm, I had to wear multiple hats. So I was effective as a salesperson, but only so effective because again, it was one of many jobs. Once you hire this commercial sales organization and they live and breathe, you know, opening new accounts or selling more to existing accounts every single day through the specialization, they become a true specialist and they'll become better than the partners. Yeah, I absolutely believe in what you're saying. And in the end, it's um, yeah, building the machine and not being the machine. If you yes. at some point, and, and that's also the purpose of, of your uh, the organization that you mentioned, and also you want to help uh, company owners sell their business for a multiple, that is really, really good. Um, you have to make your company independent of or independent of your of yourself. So that's one crucial step. And if you don't do that, you will never able to sell at a decent price, at least. That's correct. I mean, the two for all of you for all of those owners of professional services firms that are listening right now who may want to sell their firms at one point. This issue that Sammy just brought up about the firm being dependent upon you is, is a crucial issue. There's two things that you need to do to make yourself obsolete. So number one, never bring in any work. So 100% of the revenue generation should, should happen for, from people other than you. And number two, never deliver any work. So 100% of the work that gets delivered to your clients should be delivered by other people. If you're in either of those work streams, the generation of revenue or the generation of client satisfaction, when somebody buys you, they're not going to let you leave because you're in the mission critical workflows. If you're not in those workflows and you're still growing as a firm, then you've proven that you're obsolete, no longer needed, and, and you can sell your firm and the dollars you're pulling, pulling out of the firm now get added back into the EBITDA statement and everybody wins as a result of that. So not only does the multiple go up, but the, the total EBITDA number goes up because you're, you're replacing yourself. You've worked yourself out of a job. But again, that goes against human nature, right? I mean, the, the idea of making yourself obsolete scares a lot of people, but that's the goal. You know, somebody once said, 
the devil's greatest trick was he convinced the world he didn't exist, right? And that's the same thing we need to do here as owner of firms. Convince the world you don't exist, and then you'll be able to sell your firm at some point. That's a simple formula. Huh? It's a one sentence uh, mantra and a lot of things you have to do to, to, to manage to get yeah. there. But yeah, it's, I love it. Um, so there are some things that people, I have a few people in mind and I already know what they would say. So I'm just playing uh, them basically, them as advocate and you can answer what you would uh, tell them. So first of all, um, I don't believe that other people can sell as good as I do would be one thing. Um, and, and, or maybe they even tried it and those people were not as efficient as I was. So I stopped it immediately. Yeah. Okay. So what makes a salesperson effective is really two things. So number one, it's the environment that they're selling in. Okay. So if, if you're the owner of your firm and you're hiring salespeople and not, they're not doing as good as you are doing, that's because you haven't built the system in place. So what does that mean? You know, maybe you haven't systematize your value proposition. Maybe you haven't figured out who to hire, what the right hiring profile is. Maybe you're not pointing that salesperson at the right accounts, you know, those with the greatest potential and the highest propensity to buy. Maybe you're not training, you know, the person effectively. Maybe you're not, your incentive system is out of whack. You know, there's a lot of environmental factors that come into play to, uh, you know, make a salesperson successful or unsuccessful. The other thing that I would tell people in terms of the second item is, you know, don't underestimate the ability to make a hiring mistake. Okay. The world is filled with very, very talented people. And to say, if I'm an owner of a firm and I say that no one can sell as good as me, what I'm basically saying is I'm the greatest salesperson on the planet. That's a pretty arrogant statement, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot of really, really capable people that could sell. Um, as well as you. And maybe you just haven't figured out your hiring profile just right. Yeah. And the other thing is, is it, this isn't optional. I mean, if you want to scale your firm and sell it at one point, you have to do this or you're never going to accomplish the goal of exiting. So even if you make a mistake, one, two, three, ten 10 times, keep at it because every time you make a mistake, you're going to learn something and just keep iterating until you get it right. I mean, I, I didn't get it right. You know, the first few times I tried to do it, um, and I just had to keep iterating. And finally, we landed on it, you know? I mean, strategy is where do you play and how do you win, okay? So if you're gonna hire a sales team and you can't answer those two questions, where do you play and how do you win? Then maybe you're not setting the salesperson up for success. Yeah, love what you're saying. And I can absolutely relate to that one. I mean, I have a small um, business running and I have this mantra of building a machine and not being the machine. So even though I was selling okay and good, I would say, I took in our like very young employees, 24 each, both like um, Pimen and Lena, and um, we had a playbook and it was working. And so I thought, okay, let's give it a try. And they didn't perform the first course. Uh, I was with them then, I gave them some feedback, they got better, we improved our sales deck together. Um, and, and now they are selling and I don't even have to be like, I don't do anything anymore. You know, they're doing the sales course, they're closing the deal, they're writing the contract. Um, I love it. it it's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's it's great. <laughs> and I, I mean, of course, it would hurt if one of them leaves, but it doesn't matter because I have a playbook and I know yeah. what kind of profile I need. So I just hire another person and, and, and I can build a machine. You know, it's replicatable. I can do it. We try it out in different countries now, not only in the Dach or German speaking region. So uh, this gives you a totally different leverage on how to scale a company in terms of sales. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and you mentioned the word playbook there. And that's a great way to think about it. It's a playbook, meaning there's multiple plays, you know, depending on the situation that you're in and codifying it into a book. So, you know, an average human can learn it is, uh, is the task at hand. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, if, if we can do it, and I'm not a salesperson by trade, uh, I come from a totally different background. I'm a mathematician originally. <laughs> so if I can, I can do it in a basic level and we succeed on some level now, I think everybody can do it, honestly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that you were an effective salesperson with your background being in math, because what is math? Math is solving problems. I tell people all the time. <laughs> I wrote a best-selling book in 2008 called Top Grading for Sales, which was how to hire salespeople. And me and my co-author, Dr. Brad Smart, uh, wrote this book together. And it did really well for a number of years. And it was about competencies to look for in a salesperson. And, and I would tell you that st statistically, the causality 
of someone's ability to be an effective problem solver and someone's ability to be a fantastic salesperson is very, very, very high. Um, it, it's the number one competency, in my opinion. Can a salesperson, when engaging with a prospect, help the prospect understand their problem and help them solve their problem? Excuse me, we're, we're working from home here in the Amazon guy just showed up at my front door and my dog is barking. So I apologize for that. <laughs> all good, all good. You're all living in the same times right now. <laughs> yeah. So problem solving as a competency is a, is a fantastic one. And if you just think about that, if you think of the field that you might hire from, you might pull from to hire salespeople, I don't think entrepreneurs, owners of, of firms think about that. Like most people would never think about hiring a mathematician as a salesperson. But the core skill of solving a problem, a complex problem, that is the skill. And it's highly transferable to sales because you're sitting down with a customer. Sometimes a customer doesn't even really know what their problem is. They have a hard time articulating it. You know, and, and through effective framing of the problem, you can help the customer think about what the problem is. And then by presenting solution options, you know, A, B, C, and helping them walk through a pros and cons based on an established evaluation criteria, it's almost formulaic if you think about it. So something like a math background is a great background for sales. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I can relate to it because I'm a mathematician, but I think there are different kinds of backgrounds that have different traits that are positive. But I'm, now I'm super curious. You wrote a whole book on, on how to hire the perfect salespeople um, and I'm hiring salespeople. So um, of course I'm going to look into your book, but can you give me high level tips on on how to do it in a good way or how to structure a process, what to look for so that it's fitting your own company. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the science that I learned from my co-author, Dr. Bradford Smart, who created the, the terminology and the methodology of top grading. I'm going to dramatically summarize here, but his belief was past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So if you can look at somebody's work history and personal history chronologically, starting from today, and moving all the way back to the time that they were in university, you can start to spot patterns. And in his belief is that everybody can be an A player at something. Okay, we're all born with certain God given talents. And when we have our moments of great success, and our moments of great fulfillment, is when what we're asked to do are the things we're naturally gifted at doing. And when we're struggling in life and in our jobs, it's because we're being asked to, asked to do things that aren't, you know, we're not gifted at doing. It's just, it's, it's a stretch for us. And believe it or not, hiring salespeople has more to do with job design than it does with picking the right person. It's truly understanding the job all the way down to the task level. What am I gonna ask this person to do and really understanding it? So then when you're interviewing somebody, and you do something like a case study or et cetera, you can test for the actual job. And I have found that most often when people make hiring mistakes, which in the sales profession are very costly, sometimes five to 10 times salary. Um, and that's not even including the opportunity cost about you know blowing the next big deal or destroying, destroying the brand reputation or what have you. Most hiring mistakes are, are because the job's not well understood. It's not necessarily because I hired the wrong person. Yeah. We have um, one advice on my small company, Andreas. He's a startup fund in the United States, originally from Germany. And he gave me exactly the same tip from a different person, though, but it's exactly the same uh, logic. Um, yeah. And I will also, his name is Joff, but I don't know his last name, but I will also link it with your book into the show notes. And it's exactly the same. Um, you first have to describe, he said, he added one thing. You have to have KPIs and numbers in there. So the things that you will evaluate the person when they when you hire them. And what I loved a lot about it, once you have that, everything else falls into place. So as you said it, uh, in the interview process, we so to say go into the path of that person and ask questions. And it's a really nice conversation, but you, you look for those hints and you're like uh, investigating, you know? And the thing that they added is, and maybe you did it too then, is, um, you ask for reference. So you say, what would your former boss say? You ask about the name of the boss. You, you ask how they spell, you know, how you spell them. And, and then for the, on the one hand, they're pretty honest then because they know, oh, my, maybe you, you're going to you're gonna call that person and you're going to call that person. <laughs> so, yeah. so that gives you a really good insight. And, and then it's all just matching. What did I hear? Is it matching my job profile? Um, yeah. Boom. Yeah. 
you know, a little twist on that. And I agree with everything that you just said in reference checking is such a powerful tool for sure. When hiring salespeople, I recommend not only reference checking with former bosses, but I would rec uh, reference check customers. Ah, that's a good one. Yeah, and you call the customers and you say, can you tell me about your sales experience when you, when you were having a conversation with Sammy? And, and they'll tell you about, you know, from the perspective of the customer or the prospect, which if you think about it, if you're hiring a salesperson, that's a highly relevant reference check, right? Because you're going to put that salesperson in front of your prospects, in front of your customers, and, and you want to you want to get a feel for what that uh, you know what that experience was like. Mm -hmm. How do you get to that customer? Do you ask in the interview? Like same same thing. Yeah. Okay. So you ask the salesperson. Listen, I'm going to do some reference checking. I'd like to speak to three current or former clients. And in in the in the context of top grading, that's known as torque, threat of reference check. T O R C exactly. torque, right? And if they, if they can't come up with three clients for you to speak to, then that tells you something right there, right? They, they, they don't do a good job of maintaining relations. Um, and, and that's a competency that you want in your salesperson. Those that can give you 30 of them, you know, that will tell you that, wow, this is somebody who, you know, really does a good job. And what you find is salespeople that can't give you references for former clients. The main reason for that is, is that they were, they were hit and run specialists. And what I mean by that is they sold them something and then they, you know, they, they took off and, and maybe they over promised and under delivered and they got out of Dodge, so to speak, before that got revealed. And, uh, and of course you don't want that. So the, the threat of reference check, the torque include the former clients. That'll be very helpful. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I will use it from now on. Really cool. Um, One other question I, I have in mind is uh, what I see in those consultancies, I mean, generally, they are a immature sales organization. That means they don't even have a sales team, but also their marketing team is like reduced to, I mean, they call themselves or they, they call them marketing, but in fact, they're doing some PR, they're writing yeah. some articles, and it has nothing to do with like what marketing in other companies usually does. So what would, what would you, what would be the steps if you have that kind of rudimentary or even no marketing team, what would you do? Yeah. So the first thing that I would suggest to you is uh, there's investment needed. Okay. So if you're running a consultancy, let's just use that as our case study. Mm -hmm. You have to invest in sales and marketing. Now there's two types of investment. You can invest dollars or you can invest non-billable hours. Okay. So for those that aren't bullish on this idea, and might be unwilling to write a check, what I would say is, okay, so go back to you, your utilization reports. Take a look at the time that's not built, which for a typical management consultancy, let's say utilization averages, I don't know, 80%. So you got 20% of non-billable time available per employee. So let's say an, an employee works 50 hours a week. Um, so that's 10 hours a week, you know, times 50 weeks. So there's roughly... 500 hours of available non-billable time. Now I'm sure that those 500 hours are already accounted for. They're being spent on something else. But if sales or business development is important to you, take some portion of those non-billable hours, those 500 hours and dedicate them to sales and go to that person and say, okay, so you know, of those 10 hours of non-billable time per week, I want you to spend five of them on sales activity and then tell them exactly what it is that you want them to do. The easiest place to start is by focus on, focusing on your existing clients because existing clients are approximately seven times easier to sell than a new client. And that's a stat that comes from many different sources. It's highly reliable and it's been dependable for years and years and years. And if you're deployed on a project right now, you have a, a, a wonderful moment of trust that the client is giving you. And if you look a little to the left, a little to the right, you know, out of scope, so to speak, you can probably notice problems that your client's having that you may be able to solve for them. And that's, that's a good use of those five hours in our little use case here. And then you can bring it up to the client. And, and, it, and it's brought up in such a context that it doesn't feel salesy. Like you might say, hey, let's say, Sammy, you and my client. Hey, Sammy, while I was working on your project this week, I noticed something. You know, I noticed X, Y, and Z. And I think if that's not addressed, this is going to create a real problem for you. The consequences of that problem are this. You know, do you, do you acknowledge that you have that problem? Am I looking at this correctly? And if the client says, yeah, it's funny you should bring that up, Greg. You know, I, I am dealing with that. 
the client almost always says, what do you suggest we do? And then you can say, well, here's how we've solved that problem for our other clients. You know, would you like to meet our subject matter experts that deal with that? Yeah, why don't we do that? Next thing you know, there's a cup of coffee being shared and you're having a conversation about my, how you may solve that problem for the client. But I have found when I, when I look at investing in consulting firms in particular through my role as chief investment officer at Capital 54, I have found there to be 30 to 50% upside just there. That's amazing. That's amazing. just by looking at the, at the existing accounts. And that can be done with no investment because you already have the staff on, on board. You're focusing on non-billable time. So, you know, that's a trick where you can grow revenue without having to spend any dollars. Yeah, now, absolutely. As it relates to new logos, okay, new business and a proper marketing function that, that you mentioned. Well, when you're selling services, it's all about demonstrating your thought leadership, right? So if you think about what you're doing here today, Sammy, is that you've identified an expert, in this case, me, and you asked that expert to come on your podcast and we're recording a show and, and, and that show is going to attract an audience and, and, and you're going to be the, the thought leader that leads that audience. And, and over time, your listeners will develop a brand affinity for you. And, you know, they'll hire you and your firm over time because that's the way you did it. That type of marketing, which takes time and effort and thought is much better than, you know, the way you market a product which you might do on like a pay-per-click ad or, you know, I don't know, yesterday was the Super Bowl here in the United States. Maybe you spent $5 million on a 30 second spot. That doesn't work very well uh, in, in the services sector. Services are intangible. It's, they're tough to understand. When a client is getting ready to spend a million dollars with you on a huge project, they wanna know one thing, what do I get? And the way that you demonstrate in services is that you thought lead them, you know, yeah. you discuss with them, you know, your expertise, that's how you demonstrate. So that, that would be my uh, immediate advice um, is thought leadership content marketing as a way to uh, invest in marketing dollars to open up new accounts in a services business. Yeah, love what you're saying. Um, one remark about um, the upselling for existing clients. Um, I think an easy way to to get the fear out of this selling term because some people don't want to be salesy is, and that worked really well for our company. I mean, we are not selling, we are helping clients to solve the problems. Yeah. And sometimes our solution is the right fit. Sometimes we know someone who is the right fit. Maybe it's outside the company, but if you have the mindset and the gut of gut feeling of, Hey, I want to help you. And I see some things where you can get better. Um, the the non salesy people can do it more naturally somehow. Um, yeah. And and for me it worked really well because I'm not a salesperson, so yeah. that that might that might help. Yeah. Um, and for the for the second one, I must say I'm a super big fan of podcasting now. Um, in the end, because on the one hand I um, I learn a lot, so I can ask all the questions where I want to have an answer. Amazing from experts like you. That's like and for free. I mean that's yeah. that's yeah. crazy. Crazy, you know. And, and the second one, I build a relationship with really interesting people. Who knows if I can help them or they can help me at some point of time. Yep. And the third one is you get a lot of content out of one piece. You know, you can repurpose it. You can cut out snippets of videos or, or blog posts or a quote and, and post it and, 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 or send it in, in a monthly update to your potential clients and existing clients. And, uh, and that's not safety. That's providing value. So that's really good. Cool. And, and, and let me add to that long list of benefits of podcasting. So for those that are watching the video, I'm holding up my book right now Yeah. called the, called the boutique, how to start and sell, start scale and sell professional service terms. Now, if you think about reading a book or listening to a podcast, what's a more intimate experience? Yeah, definitely. The hearing podcast. Someone. Yeah. Right. Right. So my point in, in, in saying that is that, when you invest in content, you should invest in multiple forms. So written text versus audio versus video, et cetera. But the minute somebody puts those earbuds in their ear and they hit play and they can hear, the, the level of intimacy goes up dramatically. So for example, you listened to John Warlow's podcast and you heard about me and you reached out and you said, hey, that might be a guy I want to talk to. Because you got a feel for what kind of guy I was by listening to me. Definitely. It's, it's, it's hard to do that when you read a book. So podcasting is just so much more intimate. And therefore, I think more, more um, 
productive, more it converts at a much higher rate because of the level of intimacy. Yeah, it basically builds a human to human connection to your potential clients without you having to talk to each one of them. So exactly. it, I have the feeling that they already knew you because and, and when you start talking, I know the voice, you know, it's totally different. Uh, it's I amazing. Agree. I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Um, let's go into one one other point that you mentioned um, that let's automating and licensing um, a product, so to say. So that's not um, And you, you, you said it in a nice way in, in the podcast, it's not, or in your own podcast, we have to talk about it in a second. You said you're not producing PowerPoint slides anymore. That's like not the future and you will not survive or your company will not survive the next 10 years if you're still producing PowerPoints. Uh, can you deep dive into that one, please? Yeah, I mean, there's an app for everything now, right? So if, if you're producing a PowerPoint deck or an Excel spreadsheet or whatever, I mean, you're, the val you're only so valuable to your clients. When, you, when you're representing a professional services firm, the most important thing to think about in terms of growing your firm is how am I becoming more valuable to my clients? I mean, that is the question, okay? And if, if my value to my clients is going up every year, then the amount of money that my clients are going to spend with me is going to go up every year because every time they spend a dollar with me, if they make five, they're going to keep spending dollars with me, right? So how do you increase the value? What's, what's wonderful about digital transformation, in this case, replacing PowerPoint decks with an app, is the value never ends. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example, and I, and I shared this with John on the podcast, but I'm assuming that you have a different listenership, so they'll be hearing this for the first time. We used to do what was called segmentation work. So a large consulting firm, let's say Bain, would come into a big company and they would segment a market. And they would say to their client, okay, you should focus on financial services firms in the New York City metroplex area and here's why, okay? And then that, would, that tool would get thrown over the fence to sales and say, go get them. And sales would say, well, what am I gonna, I can't sell to a market. I have to sell to an account and I have to sell to an individual or a group of individuals inside of that account. So we would take the segmentation exercise from a market down to an account and down to a buyer. And we would produce things like buyer maps. So if you're going to call on Citibank, knowing uh, who you were and what you sold and the problem you solved for clients, we would identify the 11 people in Citibank that you would sell to and, and the reasons why. Now, if I handed that to somebody in a spreadsheet, the moment I give it to them, the value of that spreadsheet starts to decrease. Why is that? Well, things change. Those 11 people, you know, people quit jobs. They move on. Maybe they change their email addresses or mobile telephone numbers and you can't reach. It starts to deteriorate. Whereas if you deliver that via an application that was constantly updated almost in real time, the value of that solution you provided to the client remains in perpetuity. And if it remains in perpetuity, you now can change the way you charge for it. So instead of charging a project fee to complete a deliverable and disappearing, you could charge a licensing fee for the right to access your intellectual property in perpetuity over time. That's the difference. And I, and I think we're still in the early stages of this. The professional services firms that are thriving right now, they're delivering apps. The, those that are still struggling with the feast or famine or boom or bust associated with project-based consulting companies, They haven't done that yet. You know, they're still delivering the old way and that represents growth opportunity. How would you have to change your organization if you want to do the apps? Well, obviously your delivery team and the skills of your delivery team change. You know, you're going to need people who know how to write apps. You know, you're going to need software coders. Now, many of you that are listening right now might say, oh my God, you know, how am I going to do that? Well, this goes back to an earlier point. The world is flat. There's global workforces all over the place. Software engineering talent is in plenty supply. And it's surprisingly inexpensive because most of it comes from countries like India, et cetera. And you can rent that capability for pennies on the dollar. And then if you think about that from a business person's perspective, so I get this new capability for pennies on the dollar, but because I've made myself more attractive to my clients, I can charge more. So now my margin is increasing dramatically. Instead of spending, you know, 
maybe a few hundred thousand dollars on some expensive, well-educated first world people. <laughs> I'm spending hundreds of dollars on some extremely well-educated third world people. And by the way, what they're giving me is even better than, than what the first world people can give me. Yeah. Right. So, so that's how, that's how to do it. Um, got it. I mean, to, to put it simply, you basically, uh, you call it app, uh, other, others would call it software as a service. Um, right. You see it in the evaluations of the stock market, you know, the $1 of revenue of a software as a service uh, product is like uh, 10x. So you get for $1 of revenue, 10x valuation, at least at the stock market right now. And probably for a service company, it's maybe one, one and a half x. Uh, so for normal revenue, so um, that shows you the power of uh, subscription and, and productized revenue. Here's what's different between the two, though, because I'm not advocating that services companies become software as service companies. Okay, software as a service company is they're a software company, they make a product, and they have millions of users. Okay, what I'm suggesting is a service company they're going to make a software product, but it's only going to have one company that's using it. That's the distinction, right? They're still a services company; they're not a software company. And they're going to write code for the use for that one client. They're now not going to write code for the whole universe. That's the big difference. Okay. It's, they're still a consulting firm, so to speak, but their deliverable is an app as opposed to a PowerPoint deck. But the people that have the right to use that app is that single client. Understood. But let me ask you this question at your own company, when you created those apps, Did you have to write them from scratch every time or did you have a big chunk that you can repurpose and you had like a little tweak, of course, so that it's like individualized and you know yeah. what I mean? We, we were even more basic than that. We didn't write any custom code at all. <laughs> There were third party software tools in the market that did what it is that we needed to do. Um, for example, we did a lot of surveys. So we use Qualtrics as our survey tool, right? It made no sense for us to build a custom survey tool. And we struck a deal with Qualtrics that allowed us a certain use of that tool and allowed us a certain customization of that tool. And that got us to where we went. So that's another, I guess, helpful hint. And that was a great question, Sammy, because I was forgetting about that. There's all kinds of available third-party software tools already built that you could tap into and leverage uh, in the service del delivery element. Great. Um, I mean, I bet a lot of people, and I, I, I know the story, so I, I know that it's a really good story. And a lot of people would like to know, how did you build your company and how did you pull it off? You know, how do you build a 30 person company with 30 million of revenue, such a high margin of 50% and then sell it for almost six times revenue? Yeah. Well, how did I do that? That's a good question. Um, we had exceptional margins, and that drove a certain buyer type that was willing to consider us. That's a lesson for the audience is that there, there's different pools of buyers or universe of buyers. And given the type of business that we were and the profitability of it, we attracted institutional buyers that had large amounts of capital that need, they needed to deploy, and the attributes of our business attracted them. So that's the first thing. We were very specific as to who we marketed our business to. Um, the next thing is we hired a world-class investment banking firm. Um, it was a, at the time it was called MHT Partners. Now it's called Cowen, C-O-W-E-N. There's two gentlemen over there, Sean Terry and Alex Hicks, and their expertise on uh, going to a certain group of buyers and telling them our story was just invaluable. And I would credit them with, with uh, much of the success. In fact, I mean, I'm guessing now, but I think if I use somebody else, maybe I would have got half that value. That, that's how talented they were. The other thing is that, I mean, it was very clear that um, our business was a very low risk business because we had a very high repeat purchase rate from our clients. We had very low employee turnover. We had productized most of our offerings. That was validated in our exceptional growth rates and profitability rates. Um, that, I mean, that, that's how we did it. I mean, all, all the things we talk about, you know, in terms of growing, scaling, and exiting a firm, you know, that playbook, so to speak, um, 
we we lived it and it and it, it worked and it was validated um can you quickly summarize what your company was doing oh sure sorry so we were a management consultancy um but we were niched we focused on business to business sales effectiveness um we competed really with uh kind of three types of firms so there were the big firms which were most often for us bain mckinsey and boston consulting group there was a group of boutiques that were similar to us. So uh, ZS Associates, the Alexander Group, uh, and a few others. The name of our firm was SBI or Sales Benchmark Index. And then there was a whole, I mean, there were literally hundreds of kind of smaller one-man shops, mom and pops, whatever, and we competed with them. Um, and our value proposition was uh, the problem that we solved was the, the revenue growth rate wasn't where the client wanted it to be. They weren't growing faster than their industry and they weren't growing faster than their competitors. And the solution that we provided to them is we applied the science of benchmarking to the art of sales. So our ability to diagnose the problem was surgical. Um, and that was the unique value add. Most of our clients knew they had a problem and weren't sure why. And we were able to find and solve that problem. And then because of the value proposition, their willingness to pay was very high. I mean, we had a, a $1 million per head in revenue per head, which was exceptional. And that was driven more from what the clients were willing to pay than it was the number of people we had. You know, if you think about that, there's revenue in, in the numerator and number of employees in the denominator. We optimized for the numerator. And in our results, there was a very clear client return on investment. They knew if they spent X with us, they were going to get Y plus or minus 5%. So we were willing to charge a lot because the benefit was so great. You know, what we asked them to share with us in terms of the value created, somewhere between 10 and 20%. So if I created a hundred million dollars in value for somebody, you know, them paying me 10 to $20 million over one, two, three years or something like that was reasonable in their mind. And it was, and uh, we would guarantee our work. Um, so that, that's how we did it. So basically if I were a customer of your old company, At that time, um, you guarantee me that I get a X percent of ROI, and if I didn't get it, I wouldn't have to pay as much to you. Yeah, there was there was downside protection, mm -hmm. and every contract was a little different. It wasn't a typical 100% money back guarantee, but there was definitely a penalty for underperformance. Mm -hmm. But there was also upside, and you know we participated in uh, above average performance. So if we promised a certain level of performance and we exceeded that, then uh, we participated in that upside. Mm -hmm. Love it. So we are almost done with our time. I could talk like for hours with you because I have so many more questions, but we have to wrap it up now, Greg, yep. with um, five questions. Um, what do you do to keep body and mind fit and sharp? I'm sorry, one more time. What do you do to keep body and mind fit and sharp? Body and mind fit and sharp. Uh, I meditate and I read. Uh, and I make that a daily practice. I read and meditate probably for, I don't know, I meditate for maybe 20 minutes a day and I read for maybe an hour and a half a day, every day. So good next question. What's your favorite business book? Well, right now it's my book. <laughs> But I would say um, other than that, my favorite business book is Think Fast and Slow, yeah. which yeah. is science behind decision making. Yeah, I love it. Love it. But you really have to take your time to read that book. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite business leader you follow? Oh, that's easy. Jeff Bezos. Yeah, I, I think he's a once in a generation leader. And he's taught us all how obsessing over the customer is what creates wealth. Mm -hmm. um, who should be our next podcast guest and why? Oh, boy, that's an interesting question. Um, thinking about your audience. You know, there's a member of Collective 54. His name is Carter Hopkins. And Carter Hopkins um, is a recruiter that specializes in hiring sales talent. And he, he has, he's, an, he's truly an expert. And given the questions that you asked me today on how difficult it can be to hire salespeople, he might be a good person to uh, interview. And I'm, I'm not sure if he's open for it. I don't want to speak for him, but if you're oh. interested, I can make the introduction. That would be amazing. I, I would love to try. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and now you can directly address our audience, anything they can help you with. Um, you know, I would just direct everybody to a few websites. Um, so if you're an owner of a professional services firm, 
and you're trying to grow scale and someday sell your business, I would direct you to www.collective54.com. Um, if you're somebody who has a business they want to sell either in total or part, and you're in that industry vertical, I would send you to www.capital54.com. Um, and then if you're, if you're um, into podcasts, I would go to collective54.com and click on resources and you can read our podcast. And if you're a reader, uh, I would go to Amazon and buy the book, which is titled The Boutique, How to Start, Scale and Sell the Professional Services by yours truly, Greg Alexander. I put all, the, all of those links in the show notes. And um, if people would like to get in touch with you, what is the easiest way? Yeah, probably my email address, which is galexander at, uh, sorry, galexander at capital54.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. We learned a lot. It was a pleasure. Time flew. Uh, so honestly, um, thank you, Greg. Sammy, it was my pleasure. I appreciate you reaching out to me and best of luck to you in the future. Thanks a lot. To you too. Bye. Okay.